Although I'm fascinated by the way that pop culture has come to replace mythology, I mostly hate it. I'm both excited by and leery of the commercialization of the fireside chat, where tales of old were shared. I'm both pleased by and terrified of the disappearance of the church, where collective experiences of divinity were expressed through aesthetic and narrative techniques, and its replacement by mass media, which does not always aspire to the status of art, let alone divinity. I have a love-hate relationship with pop culture, but I hate vampires. Holy in my opinion, the trope of the vampire has been in decline ever since 1922's Nosferatu, or so I said until I played The Witcher 3, Blood and Wine. Which is a brilliant piece of literature, by the way. Rather not hurt you. <laughs> I thought the distinction sketched out in that game between higher and lower vampires, which I saw again more subtly in What We Do in the Shadows, was a fascinating one. I was curious why, out of the 10,000 monsters in the Witcher bestiary, the higher vampires are considered the single most dangerous. So here's the classical take on vampires. They embody working class fears of the upper class, while zombies embody upper class fears of the working class. Well, if vampires represent the dangers of the upper class, then what's the difference between higher and lower vampires? Are we just talking about different echelons within that upper class? It seems that this classical class reductionist take on vampires isn't quite enough to explain this distinction. You have to think in metaphorical terms, or even in metaphysical terms. Well, here's my answer. Lower vampires are ideology, while higher vampires are ideas. Let me explain. I say ideology because ideology dies in the harsh light of awareness, just as lower vampires die in the light. The Freudian take here is that vampires are what's repressed. They're both Eros and Thanatos. They are the unconscious, which cannot remain unconscious in the light. I understood at last how my love could release us all from the powers of darkness. But the Freudian take isn't quite enough here. I'm using the word ideology for a few different reasons. First of all, ideologies are dynamic. They are good at concealing themselves in their environments. They can dodge the light of awareness. They can flee. They can command rats and bats. They can shapeshift. They can seduce. Parts of them can be scarred by the light without killing them fully. Some vampires need a lot of light to kill, while others explode with one tiny pinprick. Consciousness is the sun. Is there a more basic metaphor? Anything that falls under the sun's light also falls under its gaze. The gaze of the sun, of the father, the one source of light. Vampires love the moon, the reflection, the false light. So the metaphysics here is theological. It's something along the lines of Shadows are not the presence of darkness, but rather the absence of light. And what, except something which is not really alive, dies the moment that it's perceived fully. Thus, there's an elegant metaphor at work here. To kill a vampire is to banish false consciousness. To kill a vampire is to serve the truth. This is why vampires are old, hundreds, sometimes thousands of years old, just like old ideologies get equally entrenched, they start to seem self-evident, impossible to question. They seem timeless, without origin, just the way the world works. Lower vampires are born artificially, through the act of murder, just as new ideologies are always reconstituted from older ones that came before them, often consuming emergent processes that could lead civilization into new directions, this is the capture mechanic of cultural hegemony. The model is quite simple. You take something subversive and you make it empower the status quo. I'm sure Dracula would love to make Van Helsing his thrall. But why would they do this? The answer is obvious, to remain connected to the human species of the present, of course, for young blood. But this is why the distinction between the higher and the lower vampires makes so much sense to me. All vampires are immortal in the sense that they don't die unless they're killed and they can only be killed in a number of very specific ways, depending on which text we're looking at. But higher vampires are immortal in another sense. 
They are eternal. They have no birth. They're timeless. They're ideas in the platonic sense. They're gods. To something eternal, life looks very different. An individual life is extremely petty when you have watched millions of generations come and go. To them, even lower vampires still appear mortal. He's sicked a swarm of lesser vampires on the city. I have to stop him. But I do not. Lower vampires are provisional. They're tools. You create one when you need one, when you want to pull the levers of history. But they won't last forever. I'm sure this is how the ideologies of the last thousand years look to, say, an interdimensional shape-shifting reptilian that eats adrenochrome, I mean blood. Even if they seem natural and eternal to us mortals who live under their reign, ideologies never last, but ideas do. The philosopher Gilles Deleuze called philosophy the creation of concepts, not ideas. The creation of concepts is always a synthetic act, a formalist act. Concepts are not discovered, they are constructed. Deleuze also warned against our becoming a state philosopher, or should I say he warned against a state becoming philosopher, who generates concepts that serve the empire and all the stratifying forces of governments and markets and all things that seize newness and consume its energy, draining its blood to keep old lies alive. State philosophers are human familiars who legitimize the drinking of blood and perhaps even help the vampires to do it. Higher vampires, therefore, do not die in sunlight. Platonic ideas can survive being critiqued. They may be sliced up, but they cannot be killed. Thus, we have this mythological motif of appeasing the vampires, acquiescing evil with human sacrifices, gifting the Minotaur 14 Athenian youths, and so on. In this mindset, our only hope is to strike a balance with these forces of nature, this unstoppable evil, this eternal hunger. However, those of us who believe in the Galactic Federation of Light and or Jesus Christ and or Conan the Barbarian and or any messianic prophecy of the good believe that true light can always kill true shadow. Because all ideas, even platonic ones, even eternal ones, are ultimately false. No vampire is truly eternal, except for that one source of all ideas, the universal mind. Nothing is eternal. Anyone who tells you to appease evil because it is inevitable, or eternal, or natural, or perhaps a little less evil than some other evil, they are brainwashed by an ideology. They are the familiars of an undead god. Wash them in the light of awareness. Cast them out in the name of the One, and crush them in Gwent.